Well, hello and welcome to today's Industrial Stage episode. Today is a special new segment. Uh, I have Heisel, who is a Chinese manufacturing company uh, who we're going to be interviewing. I have Jennifer Grant, who is the marketing manager over there, who's going to be sharing some insights about what is going on on the ground in China. Uh, they are a company in Shanghai, and we're going to hear their story on sort of, you know, what Jennifer experienced through the, the pandemic, what the response has been, what's going on over there. Uh, so this should be a really great episode. We're looking forward to it. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today on Industrial Sage. Thank you very much for having me, Danny. I'm excited about this uh, episode because I think there's been, um, there's a lot of news you hear about in the media. Uh, there's, there, there's a lot of uh, different stories that are coming out. So I'm excited to sit down. Uh, you know, with a manufacturer and kind of hear your story, hear Heisel, like what is going on, uh, what your experiences have been, what your insights are. So, um, you know, before we really jump into all that to kind of lay the groundwork, uh, could you tell me and our audience um, who Hazel, Hazel is? What do you guys do? Yeah, of course. So we're focused on um, custom parts and component manufacturing. So we specialize in CNC machining, injection molding, casting, stamping, and fabrication. So to keep it very simple, we have two routes to market. We have um, our heisel.com page, which is essentially a sourcing platform where you can hop on, release a request for quote as a buyer, and receive verified quotes from suppliers within 24 hours. And our suppliers are based in mainland China, and we also have them in Southeast Asia. We also offer a one-stop sourcing solution as well, where Heisel handle the processing of your parts from start to finish. Excellent. So, you know, obviously there's been a lot of things have happened. Um, you know, what's been the impact uh, with COVID uh, specifically to these companies, these manufacturing companies in China? Right. I mean, this is a really interesting question and certainly one that's been discussed at length in recent months. So COVID has definitely had an impact on China's manufacturing sector. From February, um, as we all know, the government policy was implemented and it forced a lot of the factories to shut down for at least a month, which essentially halted the economic production during that time. And that was at the end of January until around March, um, except for hospitals and pharmaceutical companies. So the disruption was quite substantial in terms of we have many buyers who usually come to visit the factory, and if they're not going through Heisel, um, buyers who source manufacturers in China as part of their routine come to visit the factory to see the quality, to see the capabilities. Um, but unfortunately, all of that um, was stopped since January, and still until now, um, our borders are closed for any international customers. Yeah, so that's um uh, that's a little bit of a challenge, and that was you know happening you know back in January and February. But you know, um, how has it kind of? It, it seems like we're hearing a lot of reports that, that that it's coming, it's back. You know, obviously you guys are having a faster recovery than here because you guys went through it first. You know, what is that? Um, you know, what's that been looking like for you guys? Yeah, so China has been on the road to recovery. Um, from February until now, um, I would say there is now actually complete restart. So we saw an incredibly fast bounce back, which was actually crucial for the factories, because obviously when they were closed, um, they had to keep running based on the, the savings and the cash flow that they've got. So it was crucial for them to get back on their feet as fast as possible um, so that they were actually able to reopen and, and not shut down completely. So I'd say now the situation in China um, has improved considerably and lead times um, are back to normal. Oh wow, that's okay. That's that's fantastic. So all in all, we're looking at it was a you know one to two months or so that things were really really shut down and then they started trickling. When you know when the, when things started opening, was it a, just a you know w w was it a very quick recovery like just you know snap of a finger or was it kind of trickling in and then kind of ramped up? What did that look like? Yeah, I mean it was trickling in. So um, what China did was the key factories and the key manufacturing plants were able to reopen quicker than a lot of the others, but they they did drip feed the employees back in. Mm. So it was a case of say 10% going this week, then another 10% until it gets to full capacity. And this way they were really able to control the health and safety and abide by all the regulations in China to stop the, the, the spread of the virus. So it was definitely drip feeding back into normal capacity. Yeah. So. Um... You know, as far as we talk a little bit about the, you know, the the um, 
the the response from China to to COVID. Obviously, we were, you know a lot of lockdowns and all that uh, all that good stuff. What we were hearing, um, you know, from our media here in in the states was that um, just a, a lot of uh, well, a huge responses in the sense of like building fa uh, not factories, but building hospitals and um, you know just like big lockdowns. What was what was what was your personal experience with that, like in the company, and like what what was that like um, going through that for you? Um, interesting one. Um, I have to say, it all happened very fast. So once China did start uh, responding to COVID, it acted very aggressively. So immediately at the end of January, towards the end of January, um, it undertook national mobilization mm -hmm. um, to basically it it asked every person to do their part to stop the spread of the virus. So the, the public was notified that there was a virus, we should take immediate action, we should wear masks, wash our hands, use disinfectants. And then they deployed 50,000 medical workers to the main area at that time in Wuhan to deliver the needed resources to the epicenter there. And yeah, as you mentioned, 14 temporary hospitals were actually built in Wuhan, all at a very, very fast pace. So it was really a case of two weeks for all of this to happen. And then obviously a national lockdown happened after those two weeks. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And then, you know, we were also hearing about, um, I guess, I guess what they're calling it over here, contact tracing, but um, it's just as far as being able to track down maybe like those who have been um you know they've come up you know tested positive and then you know hey who they've been in contact with what you know we're hearing some interesting things on how they were you know rolling out with technology and stuff to be able to to, to do that what what was that what does that look like yeah that that's a, again exactly what's been happening so it's china's track and trace system and essentially um it's deployed to locate and test everybody who's come into close contact uh, with somebody who has had the virus or somebody who's got the virus themselves so the government can monitor exactly where they are so we have two main apps that are doing this is wechat and alipay mm. these are two of the most commonly used apps within china and have almost actually replaced cash payments um, and these yeah, enable mm. the government to track people's whereabouts and also prevent those infected from traveling so each individual has its own health status code, and this code either shows green, yellow, or red, which reflects your current health situation. So as you enter a checkpoint, for example, a railway station, even many restaurants, um, bus stops, or any public venue, they'll first ask you to show your health code before they allow you to enter. So it's all very stringent and very controlled. Interesting. So that, I mean, that is still, that's still fully um, active right now. That is still fully active. So even though we've almost recovered from COVID-19, we still have to present those health codes and actually we're still wearing our masks um, anywhere in a public place. So it's compulsory, for example, on any public transport to keep your mask on. Um, and for any public events, um, you have to show your, your green QR code status. Okay, but like going into a manufacturing facility, for example, is that is that a, a protocol that is being enforced, I guess, by the manufacturers, or is that something the government's enforcing, or what does that look like? So this is being enforced by the government. So if it was the employees who are there daily, it would be probably the standard would be a temperature check, um, and also uh, regarding the keeping your social distance. Um, they wouldn't necessarily have to show the green QR, but if there was any buyers visiting that factory or anybody who wasn't normally working there, they would be required to show that. And, um, okay. you know, it's not just that it's by law. Everybody is abiding by this because as a collective, we all want the virus to um, well, be not done. spread any further <laughs> than it has done. So everybody right. is doing their bit and all of the organizations are following this. Yeah, you know, one interesting thing that you mentioned uh, in there as well, uh, this was kind of an interesting aside, but you said that uh, it was Alipay and WeChat. So I guess WeChat's kind of similar to like a, you know, a WhatsApp and Alipay, I'm assuming is, is I'm not familiar with that. I'm assuming it's like, a, you know, a, a cashless uh, payment system like a, pal a PayPal or something like that. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Um, exactly. So they have many, many functions. It's actually all we use um, in China most of the time. Is our Alipay or our WeChat? So it's all, it is a form of wallets, digital wallets, so where we carry our, our money. 
And it's also a bunch of other stuff where we book tickets, um, where we where we communicate with friends, where we make phone calls, um, where we can read the news, uh, a, a multitude of functions for both of the applications. We can send money, transfer money to a bank, transfer money to each other. And yet this also has all our whereabouts inside. So hmm. that also allows us to have the green QR. So if I was to go into a place that was in lockdown for any reason, and I traveled there, and when I came back, it would be WeChat and Alipay that show my green QR has now gone. Gotcha. Okay, so that's that's you know inside of those apps. One thing that I, I again, I think is interesting, you mentioned that now everything is kind of, it's gone a little bit more cashless. Was that the case before COVID or is that a result because of COVID that now things are being pushed more cashless? No, it was, it's been the case for years here. Okay. And it's just becoming more so as time goes on. So before um, cash was still accepted in all of the shops, but now, for example, there's many local shops that actually do not accept cash anymore. So if for some reason you don't have WeChat or Alipay, you can't actually make a purchase. Um, and there's been times where also I've gone to take some public transport. And most of them do accept cash, but there is some where you're in a particular queue, for example, they, they will not accept your cash. So Interesting. it's not really a result of COVID, but um, yeah, it's been a progressive, progressive thing for the last, so I'd say, three to four years. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm just curious about that. That's very, very, very interesting. All right. So let's kind of move on a little bit more about, um, you know, looking at manufacturing, you know, sort of globally and how companies have been affected as well. Um, you know, let's talk about um, a little bit of supply chain and sourcing raw materials. Obviously, there's a lot of manufacturers that go to China to uh, that, you know, as, as part of their supply chain, um, you know, they're, 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 they're big suppliers there. Um, you know, how has that all been affected? I mean, you kind of mentioned a little bit before as far as like, you know, buyers not actually being able to, to, to get on site to, you know, you know, do quality checks or, or whatnot. Um, you know, what is that? What is what did that look like initially? And what does it still look like now? So, yeah, I mean, it has had a huge impact on on buyers worldwide who would typically come to China to source their suppliers. Um, and it depends how much of an impact depends on how much they were reliant on suppliers within China. So, first of all, the complete closure of the factories initially had a huge impact and took a huge toll on on supply chains globally. Um, manufacturers that use components in their products that are mostly sourced from the infected affected areas, for example, Wuhan at the time, um, for example, 500 car part manufacturers um, operate and need to find alternative sources outside China because they actually source their car parts from Wuhan. Um, or if they can't find alternative sources, they're forced to shut down their production. So it has impacted manufacturers a great deal. And even though we've reopened, um, our borders are still closed. So nobody can come in and do any quality checking or source suppliers easily if they haven't already got them in place. Yeah, that's gonna. That's a little bit of a, uh, of a problem. I think we're going to get into that a little bit more, um, you know, about the response on there. But, um, you know, the, um, you know, what if, I guess, challenges. What if uh, Chinese companies face? Obviously, we're talking about you know, some of the some of the you know, you know, other companies are coming in and buying, uh, you know, because they're you know they have Chinese suppliers. But what about the actual um, actual Chinese companies inside mainland China? I guess that would be Chinese companies, right? <laughs> So, yeah, you mean this, the, the Chinese companies themselves? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it's twofold, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you've got the buyers who um, have had production halted or had their parts delayed, the lead time delayed. But at the same time, um, Chinese manufacturers have lost a lot of business. Yep. So within China, they now have a huge shortage of orders from countries who are still struggling with the virus. Or they have a slow drip feed of orders from countries in which are in recovery from the virus. However, these are orders are small and much smaller than they were compared to 2019. So now the rest of the world is suffering from forced closure and repercussions of a lockdown or still in lockdown. So medium and small sized businesses just don't have the capacity to make the same orders they were uh, making before. So on that hand, um, Chinese companies are, are suffering in terms of orders. They're more reliant on orders from within China. Um, Funnily enough, we, we actually conducted a study on this this year, um, our own first-hand research into Chinese factories and how, um, how exactly they've been impacted from COVID and what strategies they were adopting. 
So it did seem that they've all been affected quite substantially by um, COVID. And it just seemed the ones who were reliant on orders from the rest of the world, uh, m their ratio of orders from worldwide versus in China were more. Obviously, they're the ones struggling more because now they're fighting to get more of the uh, mainland China market, which is already quite saturated. So, yeah, really tough. Yeah, you know, it's interesting and it's, it's a big challenge because you always hear about diversification of your portfolio, making sure your business isn't coming from one place, but then, you know, you have something like this happen. You know, it doesn't matter how resilient, I mean, you know, we talk, obviously there's a big talk about resiliency of supply chain and whatnot, but it's just a very unique uh, situation to say the least. So how are, you know, some of these companies, like what are the, some of the strategies they're using to sort of adjust and, you know, and, and pivot, you know, to respond to the shortage? And you mentioned that, hey, we've got a lot of, Companies that maybe have, you know, a big global presence, but now, you know, because of their shutdown, orders have dropped. Okay, now let's focus on, you know, and mainline China. Okay, well, and now it's oversaturated because everyone else is doing the same thing. What are they, you know, how have they been responding? What are those strategies? Yeah, right. Another interesting one. So from the research we conducted last month, we found there was two main coping strategies that were being used. The first one is market expansion, and the second is strategic transformation. Hmm. Now, market expansion strategy typically focuses on marketing efforts to stabilize their existing market. So whichever market they were already in pre-COVID, they would just focus on that. So consolidating old customers and at the same time trying to develop new customers and expand into new market segments. And also strategic transformation, which is um, embracing new opportunities to carry out strategic transformation, for example, offline to online. We've seen many uh, factories who previously were just finding their buyers offline in the traditional way, now moving digital and becoming more agile, which is really necessary to respond to something that was so unexpected. Um, so the organizational structure has changed too. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, um, so as far as, you know, kind of pivoting in here we're talking about supply chain um you know big huge topic right now um how do you see the supply chain strategy moving forward for chinese manufacturing companies yeah so for supply chain um in china and the manufacturing companies i think the impact of the pandemic um within china is obviously very widely evident and um, and i though i do think that they have the resilience to move forward quickly um, from our research, it highlighted that business owners' confidence was actually um, contributing to the results of how well that they have succeeded. So we found that companies who are more agile, who are more open to change, um, will are more likely to recover faster. And I see the strategy going forward as a more online strategy. So I see most of the manufacturers now focusing on finding new customers and new market opportunities um, on a digital on a digital platform and ag ag just agility and actively responding to current challenges. Um, yeah, so I think increasing their marketing, um, not being stuck in the traditional ways and being able to respond to anything um, that is that they're facing um, and try to expand into new markets will prove beneficial and drive them forward. Yeah. So, how does it relate to you know future supply chain future supply chain strategy for those who are manufacturing you know in house or um, you know outsourcing uh, to suppliers? Yeah. So, for those uh, manufacturers in house or for those outsourcing their part manufacturing, I'll say this year has definitely taught us that just having one manufacturing stream accessible <laughs> is risky, and some of that risk can be alleviated by having several options to market. So they can't rely solely on one geographical location. We've seen that China was completely shut down. So for those people who didn't have any other supply chains um, in place, they were totally stuck. So um, if they reach out and have more suppliers and make more connections and keep a more flexible and adaptable strategy, it will result in a more stable supply chain. So um, yeah, I think this is really, really important. And for those who manufacture in-house or outsource, I think that stabilizing their supply chain is the key for the future and um, not necessarily moving their supply chain, but finding different routes to 
um, mitigate risk should anything like this happen again. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a huge topic of concern right now um, as companies are, evalu are evaluating their supply chains. There's a lot of talk and hearing about, like, as you mentioned, moving it. Um, and and as, well as, as well as also exploring other options to be able to say, hey, how can we diversify um, you know, th this and, and making sure that the resiliency aspect is there, you know, it, it is there and it's strong. Relative to actually moving a whole entire supply chain, I mean, that's you know, sounds like a little bit of a challenging uh, you know, task there. What, uh, you know, how, how difficult is that you know, how, how, or easy? I don't know. So the supply chain is very fixed and stable. It's, it's super difficult to just remove the supply chain. So it's like what happened with some companies when China was in lockdown, it said, okay, we're just going to up and move our supply chain to a different country. It's not that simple um, that the supplier doesn't know your parts. They're not familiar with you. It's hard to establish that initial relationship with them. So it requires a lot of time and planning to set up. Rather, I would recommend using an existing sourcing platform who already have supply chain networks set up in various locations and countries that the buyer could leverage as and when needed. So this will ensure supply chain resilience and stability without having for the supplier, for the buyer, sorry, individually to find new sources to, um, to manufacture their products. So again, um, going back to digital manufacturing, I believe that we will see companies worldwide turn to digital manufacturing over traditional means in an attempt to mitigate that risk and steady their supply chain. Yeah, so, um, and just another, I guess, quick question as far as like companies, you know, again, they were talking about moving supply chain. Have you seen a lot? I mean, I, there's a lot of talk. There's been a lot of talk. Have you seen an actual, a lot of movement where, where companies are just, they have completely pulled out or they're talking or they're looking, you know, have you seen a lot more uptick in terms of conversations that you guys are having with companies saying, hey, you know, we need to, we need to adjust. What is, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, we've had some new buyers coming from um, abroad, especially European buyers who have come on board because they want to prepare for the future. And they know putting all their eggs in one basket um, is not the way of the future. And so they want to use a sourcing platform like Heisel, where they have all of those options. We have a database of over 200,000 suppliers um, and geographical spread is very vast. So um, it's, it's becoming more and more uh, frequent that we are finding buyers who have this standpoint and who are coming to us because of the situation. And uh, likewise, I have heard of some people wanting to, for example, stop manufacturing in China. Um, well, this was more February, March time. Yeah. In the end, um, it's better to wait it out than try and move your whole supply chain because the time to take to set up a completely new supply chain by yourself is also, uh, yeah, very time consuming. Yeah, it seemed like there was, yeah, that, that time frame, lots of talk. Um, but then I think as it seems like as China's starting to get back, you know, was back online a little bit more, that was a little easier. But I, I think the diversification piece is probably the, the more active, you know, piece happening there saying, you know, we're not, you know, at least for the moment, I don't know, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen in the next hour, let exactly. alone six months from now or two years from now. what's crazy 2020 so far. Oh, uh, it's been horrible. <laughs> uh, nuts. But, um, you know, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about digital manufacturing. You were, you, you, you've kind of talked about that a little bit there, um, you know, uh, and that, that it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good practice to go for. I mean, you're hearing about digital, digital, digital. Anyways, we're talking about digital transformation for years before going on in all aspects of the business, you know, from anywhere from, uh, you know, generating, you know, sales and leads and opportunities, certainly sourcing suppliers, but the actual manufacturing piece. How does it really tangibly, though, like from a digital manufacturing standpoint, how does it, you know, what are the like the tangible aspects that that help that you can em employ this to really help, you know, uh, uh, defeat these uh, effects of COVID-19? Sure. I mean, personally, for me, digital manufacturing is definitely the future. It's a sphere which allows companies anywhere in the world to source uh, their manufacturing parts and components from the comfort of their own home. So now with obviously remote working becoming the norm and also lockdown becoming the norm in a lot of geographical locations, the, the, the relieving the need to travel and vet out new suppliers yourself mm -hmm. is a huge advantage. So um, the digital platform does this on your behalf. 
So essentially, they have sourced and verified their suppliers already in terms of capacity, capabilities, and quality, and put them all together into this database, which can be accessed worldwide. So a buyer anywhere can just hop on and have their access to manufacturers across the globe um, in a very transparent manner so they can see all of the capacities of the factory, the certifications, um, what kind of parts and jobs that they've made previously, um, so you can see if they've done something similar to what your project is. So extremely transparent and extremely um, convenient. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes sense. Seems like you know, it's a good answer, especially if you, you know, can't travel and you can't, you know, you're in lockdown. It's a little bit of a right. little bit of a challenge. So, you know, um, what has uh, Hazel's response been through all of this? Yeah, so we've tried to be very, very customer centered. So from the beginning, we focused on our buyers, obviously, and we wanted to protect our buyers. We wanted to protect the lead time as much as possible. And we didn't want to. We wanted to have the minimal disruption possible on um, their supply chains. And obviously, they want to then sell to the end user or use the product. So we know how important that is. So what we did was we made sure that customers were at the forefront of the strategy. We took a step back, we brainstormed what issues they're facing pre, during and post COVID and how our strategy needs to change to be able to fit and accommodate um, the new needs and the new demands. So we found that our customers were really looking for reassurance and have a reliable supplier. Again, someone who's not restricted by a geographical location that they can produce their parts and they can have their parts produced without that risk of um, the factory that they've chosen closing down. If it did so, their production would be halted or stopped. Whereas if they use Heisel, we would shift that production very fast to another geographical area or factory that would also be well suited to that project. So um, as I mentioned briefly before, we are lucky enough to have a wide network of partner factories um, spanning not just throughout mainland China, but also into Southeast Asia. So this gives our buyers a kind of safety net um, if for one reason a supplier was unable to do their job, it would be shifted. So supply chain disruption was at a minimal. And that was the main concern we found from our buyers was messaging us, contacting us to say, will you still be able to produce? Will my lead time change? Um, can I still give you a re request for quote? Um, so we tried to keep it as stable as possible. We pushed for our factories to reopen as soon as possible under the health and safety requirements, of course. And um, we leveraged on our supply network and our existing suppliers as much as possible to ensure minimum delays. Excellent. Well, you know, sounds like, um, you know, you guys were set up very, very well, uh, I think, from the beginning, be able to help to, to, to adjust to this and be able to help to really solve a lot of these very unique um, but very critical uh, challenges for a lot of these uh, manufacturers, you know, globally. So, um, you know, Jennifer, I, I really uh, thank you for uh, spending some time with me today on, on Industrial Sage. Uh, for those who would like to learn more about you, uh, you know, what's your website we'll put in the show notes. You know, what is that real quick? Yeah, so you can hop onto our website at www.heizol.com. And from there, it's free to open an account. You just um, submit your RFQ very fast. Actually, they can submit a request for quote within, for quote within one minute. Wow. So super fast, and then they can get quotes from verified suppliers who fit their project. Excellent. Well, yeah. well, Jennifer, again, thank you again. Thank you so much for spending time with us, kind of sharing your insights and your experiences, sure. um, and Heisel's what was going on uh, and what is currently going on in China. I think uh, our viewers will find that very, very valuable. So, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Danny. It's been a pleasure. Thank okay. you again. Thanks. All right, well, that wraps up today's uh, special news segment on Industrial Sage. I'm Danny Gonzalez. Thank you for watching or listening if you're on the podcast. Hey, listen, real quick, if you are not on our email list, you need to go to industrialsage.com right now, and you need to subscribe. Why? Because you're missing out on all kinds of great content like this special news segment that we're doing uh, or that we just did right now. So go do yourself a favor, do that so you can learn about what other companies are doing. It can you know, be on the leading edge of what's going on, especially right now when we have things that are changing uh, at a drop of a hat. So uh, that's it, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much, I'll be back next week with another episode on Industrial Sage.